Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and this is your yearly horoscope forecast for the zodiac sign of Virgo for the entire year ahead of 2022. If you're new to my channel, then my name is Chris Brennan, and I'm the host of the Astrology Podcast and the author of a book on ancient astrology titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. So in my approach, I synthesize a little bit of ancient and a little bit of modern astrology in order to get the best of both worlds. So each week I release new podcasts and videos on astrology on my channel, so if you'd like to get notifications when I release a new video, then please hit the subscribe button here on YouTube, and if you enjoy this video, then please consider hitting the like button to show me that you enjoyed the content and you'd like to see more of it. Okay, so my horoscopes are primarily meant to be read relative to your rising sign or your ascendant sign, which are essentially the same things. Although you can also watch them from the perspective of your sun sign, especially if you're born during the day, or your moon sign, especially if you're born at night. So the rising sign changes signs every hour or two during the course of the day, whereas the moon sign takes about two days to change signs, and the sun sign takes about a month to change signs. So as a result of that, the rising sign is much more personally relevant to you, and for that reason, I would really focus on that when you're looking at these horoscopes, or horoscopes in general for that matter. So if you don't know what your rising sign is, then all you need to do is find out your birth time and then go to a website where you can get your birth chart calculated, such as astro.com, and you should be able to get your ascendant or your birth uh, rising sign calculated on those websites. So I have a video tutorial titled How to Calculate Your Ascendant and Rising Sign on my channel, which you can either search for or, or I'll put a link to it in the upper corner of this video right here. So let me know in the comments below what your sun, moon, and rising signs are, and which sign resonates with you more when you watch your video horoscopes like this one. All right, Virgo, let's jump into it by looking at your transits for 2022. All right, here's a graph or diagram that shows where the planets will start at the beginning of the year and how far through the signs of the zodiac they'll get by the end of the year, as well as which of the 12 houses they'll be moving through at different points. Uh, in your chart over the course of the year. Here are some of the main bullet points that I want to focus on during the course of this. Uh, we're going to start with the Venus retrograde in Capricorn in your fifth house, um, and then we'll hit some of these other parts during the course of this video. Here's a second slide that shows dates. I'm going to show this right now really quickly, that way I don't have to keep mentioning the dates over and over again, but you can refer back to this slide uh, later if you need to, if there's something you're not clear about in terms of the time frame involved. All right, so first things first, um, Venus recently went retrograde in your fifth house of children, creativity, uh, sex, and sexuality, as well as the place of fun and pleasure in your chart. So this Venus retrograde actually started towards the end of last year. It actually started in December, and there were two exact conjunctions with Pluto. But it's a transit that's going to continue into early March, uh, basically as long as Venus is in the sign of Capricorn, this transit's going to be operative for you. So Venus retrogrades can sometimes um, force us to revisit and rethink and revise our social contracts with those in our lives and those around us. So for you, this could be um, because Venus stationed retrograde conjunct Pluto, it could be kind of a, a little bit of a tense transit where there's some, some tensions coming up and some intensities when it comes to um, one of the things that's involved in the fifth house is romantic relationships. So there could be some really intense situations coming up when it comes to sex and sexuality and romantic relationships at this time in your life that you're going to be working through off and on during the course of this transit of Venus through the sign of Capricorn. So sometimes this can be kind of a difficult because Venus retrogrades can dredge up things from the past, um, especially things that, that happened either eight years ago or eight years before that or eight years before that, because Venus will go retrograde in this sign uh, approximately every eight years so that you'll have some of these somewhat similar energies coming up in eight-year increments. So Venus could be bringing up some, some issues from the past that are a little bit difficult to deal with or a little bit tense. Um, Pluto-Venus connections also sometimes have to do with 
um, issues sur- uh, issues involving control and manipulation, uh, or sometimes power plays. So if you get into a romantic relationship during this time, it could be a very intense relationship where either you're very focused on and very somewhat almost like obsessed with a partner, or you find somebody else who comes into your life that's kind of really focused on you and really kind of obsessed with your relationship. So in some instances, this type of relationship can be good in that it can be very deep and um, you can have a connection with somebody that's very intense, which can feel great. Um, But on the other hand, it can sometimes bring up some kind of darker issues that have to do with um, obsession that's not necessarily healthy. So one of the things that you'll have to do during the course of this transit is try to sort through whether some of the romantic stuff you're going through at this time is like on the healthy side of things, or if it's going a little bit too far and you need to like slow things down a little bit. So that could be happening when it comes to relationships and things like that. It's also could be coming up within the context of uh, the topic of creativity and creative matters. Or alternatively, the fifth house is also the traditional house that has to do with children. So either if you already have children or you're thinking about having children, there could be some important developments when it comes to the topic of children at this time, especially something that harkens back to something that happened earlier in your life when it comes to that topic. So again, because it initially started off with a conjunction with Pluto, there could be some issues that are coming up during this time that can be tricky to sort through and deal with, but nonetheless necessary in order to move forward. So some of this is going to be the the need to work through some of these things is going to be intensified a little bit um, starting at the end of January when the planet Mars will actually ingress into the sign of Capricorn where it'll join Venus for about a month or so. So Mars will go into Capricorn in late January and it won't depart from Capricorn until Venus does on the same day on March 6th. So Mars can speed things up when it transits through a certain house. Um, It can add greater intensity and greater focus and greater fieriness to this area of our life. So it may just be a time in which you're finding that you're spending a lot of energy either on creative projects or romantic projects or on topics pertaining to the the broad theme of children in your life, Um, whatever that means, whether it's your children or somebody else's children. Um, But Mars can also sometimes bring Uh, a little bit too much fire and a little bit too much heat, which can sometimes turn into strife or discord or sometimes having a a separation or a sort of falling out. So one of the things that's going to be important to do is be a little bit careful once Mars gets there with Venus to decide if you need to make decisive action of some sort in this life, especially when it comes to romantic issues. If there's some sort of change or decision that needs to happen that requires you to sort of lead that and spearhead that change. Or alternatively, if it's just some sort of conflict that comes up during this time that you have to be a little bit careful about not to fly off the handle. Um, So some people, for example, can get into conflicts with their children, or others could get into conflicts with a romantic partner. So figuring out how to navigate that might be a little bit tricky, but at least you know, forewarned is forearmed, and you know that there's a time frame involved. So even if some tricky stuff comes up, you know that it's not going to last forever, but should be over by the early part of March. All right, so let's move into some other transits, especially some more positive ones coming up. So this may actually be tied in with the previous transit, where the next one that I wanted to discuss is Jupiter has recently moved into Pisces and into your seventh house of relationships. So this is generally speaking a pretty positive transit for growth and expansion when it comes to relationships and the general topic of one-on-one partnerships in your life. So the seventh house relates to relationships, partnership, marriage, and other people in your life in general. So Jupiter, especially for those of you with day charts, generally indicates um, growth and sometimes the start of new relationships or a positive figure coming into your life and sort of helping you out and playing a positive or optimistic role in a one-on-one capacity in a a direct relationship with you. 
So often for many people, this pertains to a romantic relationship, which could be tied in with some of your Venus retrograde transits that are going on um, in the more like romantic or, or sort of sexual area of your chart in the fifth house. But the seventh house can also just pertain to business partnerships as well. If you have a close one-on-one -on -one partnership with another person in your life, even if it's not romantic, it's just the general theme is growth and expansion through direct partnership with another person. So one thing you want you want to be a little bit careful about though is we do have a Jupiter Neptune conjunction that's going to take place this year in early to mid April. So when Jupiter gets a certain ways into Pisces, it's eventually going to conjoin the planet Neptune. And Neptune usually has to do with themes of like illusion and um sometimes things not being quite what they seem. So on the one hand, in the most positive manifestation, this could indicate a very idealistic period for relationships in your life where everything just seems amazing and everything seems great. And some of your your greatest like fantasies or ideals suddenly seem like they're becoming reality when it comes to relationships and partnerships. So that's the sort of positive, most positive manifestation potentially. The potential downside is that sometimes Neptune is not necessarily all it's cracked up to be, or there can be an initial illusion about something, but then later it turns out that things were not quite as great as they seemed, and instead there could be some sort of deception or misleading involved when it comes to relationships or partnerships in your life at this time. So it's a little bit tricky because um, usually with Neptune transits, it's hard to determine which of those two scenarios it is until you get to the other side of the transit and it's over. It's often hard to see things clearly, and there will be a tendency to probably want to see things more optimistically than they might be at the time. So I don't want to say that to completely remove the positive potential since just Jupiter going through your seventh house during this time seems like a pretty positive year in terms of relationships in general, especially in the first five months of the year, and then a little bit at the end of the year when Jupiter dips back into Pisces for like a, like a month or two or like a few weeks. Yeah, so Jupiter in Pisces until May 10th, and then it comes back October 28th through December 20th, whereas the conjunction with Neptune goes exact on April 12th. So that's a little bit more confined, especially to the earlier part of the year. Um, so just pay attention to those possibilities because one of the ultimate downsides is you definitely don't want to be led astray by somebody who's deliberately um, putting on a false pretense or is trying to lead you into something uh, through some sort of deception. Um, alternatively, sometimes it could be you that's sort of deceiving yourself or is not seeing your partner clearly um, because you want things to be more positive or like better than they actually are. So it's kind of important on your part not just to expect something from the other person, but also to try to strive to see things clearly yourself and not be sort of taken away by, you know, sort of fantasies or scenarios that are in your own head in some ways. But instead try to see the other person for who they are and what they're actually bringing to your relationship or your partnership. All right, so that is the Jupiter transit that's happening, especially for the first four, four and a half months of the year. Jupiter just ingressed at the very end of December of 2021. Um, but in May, what happens immediately after that is that Jupiter is going to ingress and move into Aries, which is your eighth house of other people's money. And it's going to stay in that sign from May 10th through October 28th. And then it's going to retrograde. Um, back into Pisces. So it's going to go into Aries into your eighth house. Then it'll retrograde back into Pisces for like a month or so. And then it's going to come back into Aries um, starting in on December 20th and going through until May of 2023. So this transit is something that's going to be off and on for the next year, basically. So the eighth house has to do with other people's money. It can also have to do with issues pertaining to mortality or inheritance or debt. Um, Jupiter, though, tends to be a more positive influence of or significator of growth and expansion. 
So typically this is like a positive transit that indicates growth and expansion coming from other people's money as a general topic in your life. So for some people, because the uh, eighth house is the second house from the seventh house of partnerships, it represents the partner's finances. So a Jupiter transit through the eighth house could indicate some sort of sudden windfall for the partner, if you're married, for example, or if you have a business partner. So perhaps your partner gets a raise or your partner suddenly comes into an inheritance or something like that. Um, one of the most common manifestations is just like an Im improvement of finances as a result of the partner's finances somehow getting better during that time. Um, so the eighth house can also be a house where sometimes mortality comes up. So it could be some sort of inheritance for you or some sort of windfall. Uh, the eighth house is also the place of debt and taxes. So I've seen sometimes people suddenly get um, money as a result of like a, a tax return that ends up being better or a tax rebate that ends up being better than they expected or something like that. So that's some of the main energies when it comes to Jupiter transiting through your eighth house, especially in the second half of the year. All right, so next I want to talk about the Saturn transit through the second half of Aquarius and through your sixth house of health and work. So uh, here is your sixth house of health and work. Saturn initially went into Aquarius, Aquarius, it dipped into Aquarius for just a little bit, starting in around March or April of 2020. But it wasn't until the end of uh, last year, until December of 2020, that Saturn fully moved into Aquarius into your sixth house of health and work. Now, sometimes a Saturn transit can bring up some obstacles and difficulties, and sometimes even some setbacks, um, where uh, you could have experienced some obstacles or difficulties in the workplace as it pertains to your job, and some things just being more difficult or more tricky or more slow than they were in years prior to this. Um, so the sixth house can also pertain to health. So sometimes different health issues can come up. They can be issues that maybe you were letting go in the past or not addressing, but then when Saturn comes in through a house, they become things that you sort of have to address and you can't put off any longer. So sometimes um, restructuring things when it comes to your health and finding better ways to maintain your body and maintain your health can be a major part of a Saturn transit that can be really constructive. Um, that idea of restructuring things when it comes to, can also be applied to the topic of work. So there may be some restructuring when it comes to your job and your work and your relationship with other people in your workplace. So this year, um, one of the periods where this is probably going to become more acute and you're probably going to have to spend more energy and more time addressing some issues in this area of your life is going to be starting in March when Mars actually moves into Aquarius as well. So there's Mars that starts off in Sagittarius, but it's going to, by the time of March, get to moving into Aquarius as well, where it's um, eventually going to meet up with Saturn. So we'll get a Mars-Saturn conjunction that goes exact around April 4th or April 5th in your sixth house of work and health. So um, Mars transits can speed things up. They can also make things more acute. So it may just be a really busy period for you where you're having to put a lot more energy and time um, and effort into health matters or work matters. Um, in some instances, it can bring up acute issues or there can be like a, a separation or a severing at this time. So for some of you, if you find yourself in a managerial position, um, or if you're like the owner of a business, the sixth house can sometimes represent uh, subordinates or people that work for you. So there could be the need to let somebody go, or there could be some sort of conflict with somebody in the workplace that's irritating or just causes strife. So for some of you, hopefully that'll be constructive and whatever issues this brings up, it's really only going to be like a month-long transit. So it starts in early March when Mars goes into Aquarius. It peaks when the Mars-Saturn conjunction goes exact in early April, 
And then Mars is already out of Aquarius and moves into Pisces by the 14th of April, and then the transit's pretty much over. So at least in terms of the sort of acute component of that, it's not going to last very long in terms of the Mars-Saturn transit, even if Saturn continues to transit through that sign for the rest of 2020, 2022. Um, Saturn's pretty much almost done in the in the grand scheme of things. Saturn's going to move into Pisces in March of 2023. So this is really the last year of this Saturn transit and most of the themes that it has to do with your your house of work and health have probably already come up and you're already aware of them and sort of working on some of those issues at this time. So the good news is that there is an end point and we're in the the sort of final stretch of Saturn going through your sixth house over the course of the next year. All right, so moving on, so I touched on the Mars Saturn conjunction around April 4th. Saturn is also going to be squaring Uranus again this year. This is a transit that was primarily happening last year, where we had three exact hits of Saturn square Uranus during the course of 2021. But as we can see on this transit graph from Archetypal Explorer, the Saturn Uranus square is going to come back in the third quarter, especially around September and October, where it gets very close to going exact again. So, this is indicating um, some tensions where Saturn, uh, sorry, Uranus, which has been transiting through your ninth house of religion and philosophy and belief and travel, and you've been having this kind of rebellious, kind of refreshing, liberating energy going through that sector of your life. Which may have indicated the development of some new philosophies, some new beliefs, some new educational directions and vistas, or some sudden and unexpected exposures to new cultures or new ways of life and thinking about the world that are different compared to what you grew up with or where you were prior to the past few years when this transit started, as soon as Uranus went into Taurus a few years ago. But there's something about some of this. Um, these major changes that are going on in your ninth house that's causing some tensions when it comes to your your sixth house of health and work and that Saturn transit that's going through that sign. So it may be that maybe some of your your new beliefs or that some of these radical changes that are happening in the education or the belief sector are somehow causing tensions when it comes to um, your work life and the work sector. And figuring out a way to reconcile those two areas of your life is going to be part of your challenge that you really need to finish doing over the course of this next year. Um, it could also be that there's something about your beliefs or some of these radical changes that could be uh, causing tensions when it comes to health and wellness. Um, maybe if there's some sort of misalignment between um, some new thing that you've gotten into or gotten focused on, like a new health idea that's sort of motivated philosophically or spiritually, but that's somehow causing conflict in terms of your actual physical um, health and wellness. Maybe there's something that's out of alignment there or that's causing those tensions. Either way, it's good to just think about some of the topics associated with the sixth and the ninth houses and how there might be some tensions in those two areas of your life or between those two areas that you can reconcile during the course of this year especially in the third quarter of 2022. All right, so that actually leads directly into the next section where I wanted to talk about the eclipses that are going to be bouncing back and forth between Taurus and Scorpio starting in April and May, but then also again in October and November. So we've already I've just talked about Taurus and how Taurus is your Ninth house of religion and philosophy and education and beliefs. That's where some of the eclipses are going to be taking place. And we actually already had one in late November of 2021 that started this whole eclipse series. Um, but there's also going to be a couple of eclipses in Scorpio in your third house of communication, travel, siblings, neighbors, and extended relatives and family. Those are the primary topics associated with the third house. So during the course of this year, you're going to have this series of eclipses that takes place, which is going to indicate major beginnings and major endings in those two areas of your life, just bouncing back and forth over the course of the year. So here's the actual dates. So the first set of eclipses is in late April and mid-May, and then the second set is in late October and early November. 
So great beginnings and great endings when it comes to those two areas of your life. So sometimes when this happens in the third and ninth house axis, it has to do with learning new things in the ninth house and some of these radical changes that are taking place due to Uranus transiting through your ninth house over the past few years and the ways in which maybe your beliefs or your outlook on the world is changing radically, um, but then needing to figure out how to communicate that and starting some major beginnings in terms of shining a spotlight on how do I communicate some of these things that I've been learning over the past few years to those around me in a way that makes sense and isn't um, alienating could be one of the topics for you. It can also be um, things involving travel and just um, mobility. So in terms of the ninth house being typically the place of long distance travel or international travel, whereas the third house tends to be the house that has more to do with um, travel over a short distance, like in your neighborhood, for example. And some sort of um, new beginnings in terms of that, and in terms of ideas of mobility in your life and just getting around the world in general, and needing to perhaps restart things or start a new phase when it comes to how you're doing those things in some way. Um, other topics the ninth house is also, or the third house is also the place of siblings, neighbors, and extended relatives. So it may just be major developments that are happening in the lives of. Your siblings, if you have any, or your neighbors, or your extended family, like aunts and uncles, who for some people are more important in their life compared to others. Um, sometimes major transits like this have to do with things that are happening in those people's lives independent of you, whereas in other instances, it can indicate um, changes in terms of your relationship with those people. That is actually significant or significantly impacts your life. So that would be something to pay attention to during the course of 2022 as we get these new beginnings and these new chapters opening up in that sector of your chart specifically. All right. So moving on, I wanted to touch on this very last transit that's going to happen pretty much the entire second half of the year, which is the Mars retrograde in the sign of Gemini, which is your 10th house of career. So this transit begins on October 20th when Mars first moves into the sign of Gemini, but it really peaks in intensity around October 30th when Mars is going to slow down and it's going to station retrograde in the sign of Gemini in your 10th house of career, public reputation, and overall life direction. So um, let's do positive negative scenarios on this. So positive scenario is that Mars can sometimes bring a lot of energy and a lot of activity to an area. So this could be a period in which you're putting in a lot of extra work um, in your career or towards achieving some sort of life goal. And during this period, suddenly you just have to increase the intensity and work a lot of extra hours and push really hard. And things might um, seem like they're bogged down or they're, they're taking longer than they need to, and you're having to expend a lot of energy over an extended period of time, which is sometimes what Mars retrogrades do because it slows down and it just starts grinding across a certain sign of the zodiac for six or seven months instead of normal Mars transits where it just quickly jaunts through a single sign of the zodiac. So it could just be putting a lot of work and emphasis and focus on career matters during the second half of the year. Um, however, sometimes Mars transits can also bring um, strife or discord or separation to this part of our chart as well, especially for those of us with day charts where Mars tends to be a little bit more challenging or a little bit more tricky. So it could be a time in which you get into some conflicts or some strife or have even a separation when it comes to your career where you have a major setback and you have to um, go a different direction where it sort of forces you to move away from potentially from one career or one thing that you've been working on at the time and instead have to go somewhere else or have to do something else. There also could just be an issue in terms of some sort of incident that happens in terms of your rep reputation at this time, especially around the time of the Mars station around late October, although the scenarios that um, happen during that time will actually be building up and being put into place going all the way back to August as soon as Mars ingresses into that sign. If you pay attention, 
the sort of scenario will start building up and the pieces will start falling into place at that point, which will eventually culminate and become more clear at the time of the, the retrograde station in late October. So the retrograde is then actually going to last for a while, and this transit's going to go well into the early part of 2023. So it's something that continues on into next year, but we'll get um, the majority of it or the brunt of it will take place in the second half of 2022. So those are some of the themes that I'd really focus on when it comes to that final transit of the year where it seems like there are some major career matters that are happening and career becomes part of the major focus of the end of 2022 for you for some reason in terms of either putting more energy towards your work and career and overall life direction in order to achieve things or in terms of having some obstacles come that come up that you have to deal with or sort of push through at that time. Um, but I think that is really the, ma- the the last major thing that I meant to mention in terms of transits for Virgo and especially Virgo rising for um, for this year. So I think that's it. So thanks a lot for watching this forecast. All right, that's it for this horoscope forecast for 2022. So as always, this was just a general forecast that focuses on some of the broad outlines of the year ahead. So if you'd like a more detailed analysis of some of the general transits this year, then be sure to check out our year ahead forecast for 2022 that we released in December. Uh, Additionally, for a more detailed analysis of your chart, you might want to get a consultation with an astrologer because they can look at it in much more detail than I can go into here in just a general horoscope. Alternatively, or better yet, you could also learn how to read your birth chart and transits on your own, which would allow you to pinpoint some of the dates involved with much more precision and exactness. So if you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then you can get a copy of my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. And in this book, I reconstructed the original system of Western astrology and recovered some techniques that we had lost uh, many centuries ago. So With this book, I sort of teach you how to read a birth chart and how to use different timing techniques in order to determine when different things will happen during the course of your life, or in some instances during the course of a single year, as I've attempted to do in this horoscope forecast. So the book is available on Amazon as well as in other fine bookstores everywhere. I also teach an online course on ancient astrology, which has over 100 hours of video lectures. Uh, It shows hundreds of different example charts in order to show you how the different techniques work in practice, and it really gets into details that I couldn't go into as much in my book, even though the book is very big. Uh, In the course, I actually get into a lot more example charts, which really gives you better hands-on experience of how to use astrology to read birth charts in practice. So you can find out more information about that at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, I also recently released my 2022 Electional Astrology Report, where I went through the year and I picked out some of the most auspicious or lucky dates uh, with one lucky date or electional chart for each of the next 12 months. So these are useful for starting different types of ventures and undertakings using the principles of Electional Astrology. The report is also available at courses.theastrologyschool.com. All right, so that that's it. So thanks for watching. Good luck in 2022 and may the stars be ever in your favor. A special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular thanks to the patrons on our producers tier including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Mo, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Isa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast.
The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year. The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwak.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org.